Well, good evening, everyone. Warren's having their um, uh, birthday bash at City Hall this uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, if you're so inclined, rides and fun and all kinds of uh, things like that. So, um, anyways, um, that'll be fun. And the, the Warren police are offering a reward if anybody knows anything about the fire, or whatever, arson regarding our, our storage unit. So I know all of you could use 500 bucks. You could be junior detectives and figure it out. Mm -hmm. But in any way, in any event, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. We'll get into this evening's message. Gracious Father, we thank you. We praise you, we honor you, we reverence you, we stand in you, Lord. Uh, bless the word tonight. Help us with wisdom and understanding. Give us insight into your word, not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers of your word. Show us, Lord, where we need to be uh, clearly shown things that we don't presently possess and we don't presently live in. Help us, bless us. Give us discernment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week I was talking about the first chapter of Job. Job had gone through quite a quite a bit of trials. Um, if you're interested in that message, um, you can um, find it online. I'm not going to re-preach that message, but um, there was a few conclusions to that message that I thought were important. And um, our text from last week ends with these amazing words. It says... In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. See, a lot of times when the pressure's on and when things don't seem to be working in our lives, we sin. But Job was such a righteous man, he didn't sin. He lost his cattle, he lost his sheep, he lost his camels, he lost his goats, he lost his children. He lost everything, but um, in all of this, he didn't sin. And he didn't even ask God why. A lot of times that three-letter word pops up in our brains. You know, why this? Why now? <laughs> why, 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 why? We all ask that question to God. But Job had such faith. He didn't ask God why. He didn't accuse God of not loving him. Because sometimes we play that card too. Well, Lord, if you loved me, this wouldn't have happened. That's not accurate. So Job never accused God of not loving him. Um, he didn't claim his rights, you know, well, you know, if I'm one of your best guys, um, you know, I have the right to this or the right to that. You gave me all these camels and cattle and sheep and goats um, and oxen. I, I deserve them. They're mine. He didn't claim his rights over them. He didn't curse God. He didn't swear at God. You know, sometimes, you know, um, when things go bad, we think God's last name is Damn and put his name in front of that and um you know job didn't do that and he didn't give up his faith either he felt firm in his faith his faith was a foundation that he felt he could stand on he simply said to himself if god takes something away from me i'll thank him that i had it to enjoy for just a little while See, Job realized that even though he was probably one of the richest men at the time, and he had great wealth, he had great possessions, great everything, he realized that none of these possessions were really his. He just had them for a little while. And as we ponder this remarkable story, I just want to give you a few conclusions, and then I want to talk about a couple other things this evening um, as well. But um, there's, there's four conclusions that I didn't get to last night. Um, and the first one's this, undeserved suffering often comes to righteous men and women. Um, you know, a lot of times we think, well, you know, I'm obeying you, God, I'm following your word, I pray, I do this, I do that. You know, we think that our um, faith is based on works, and it's not. Um, faith um, and our belief is, is, is in our relationship with God is a gift. So, you know, we think we have to earn it or, or somehow work for it, and it's not. But, um, you know, in Matthew, it says that it rains on the just and the unjust. It rains on everybody. And, um, you know, a lot of times when it rains on us, we cry boo-hoo. You know, poor me, I didn't want rain today. 
and um, you know whatever. But it rains on everybody. I mean, nobody's excluded from that. And <clears throat> when suffering isn't even deserved, I mean, think of this. I mean, when it's undeserved suffering, as it was in the case of Job, you know, there's a lesson to be learned. There's an obvious lesson here. And although we've heard it before, we probably need to hear it again. You know, three times in the text from last week, it emphasizes that Job was a righteous man, perfect before God. And what happened to him didn't happen because of any moral fault. You don't have to think, well, what did I do to deserve this? I mean, Job never thought that. Or, you know, what sin is there? You know, I'm sure his neighbors looked across the hedge and you know, one day he had everything. Next day his kids are wiped out. Everything else is wiped out. They're probably like, he's got some sin in his life that's hidden from all of us. And God just zapped him for that. You know, and that's the tendency we have. We, we try to think that there's a reason for this. But in our human tendency, when tragedy strikes, you know, we like to believe that, you know, if only I lived a little bit better. You know, if only I did things a little differently, you know, the tragedy would have never happened or the calamity would have never came. Sometimes that's probably true, but most often it's not true. Um... If the story of Job teaches us anything, it's that sometimes godly people sometimes suffer inexplainable losses. And, um, you know, terrible things sometimes happen to God's people. And, uh, you know, uh, Rabbi Kushner wrote a book when bad things happen to good people. He's a rabbi. He writes it from a Jewish perspective. It's a great book. I uh, highly recommend it. Um, I've read it a couple times myself. And sometimes... Bad things just happen to good people, and that's life. Um, the second point that I think is, is another conclusion um, that we should, we should take away from this text is that God is the source and owner of all that you have. See, a lot of us think, well, what I have is mine. <laughs> and uh, you know, they act that way, and they, they live that way. <clears throat> I was very touched um, this week. Um, a lady that I previously had some encounters with on Facebook, you know, telling me that I need to tone down my faith and I shouldn't pray and we shouldn't have a national day of prayer and we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that and you Christians should just quiet down. Um, she read about the, the, the arson um, that happened to our food ministry and um, she said, in spite of the fact that I'm an atheist and don't believe in most of the things that you guys do over there. I just want to tell you, I, um, I very much appreciate the good that you do for South Warren in the community. And uh, she gave us a very kind and generous uh, um, donation. Um, and she said, I'm still an atheist, but I just wanted to bless or help you. Didn't, she didn't say bless. She just said, I wanted to help you in your ministry. And um, I thought that was pretty amazing. You know, she could rise above her own limited thinking and, and beliefs and still wanted to help what she felt was a good cause. She says, you know, for years I've supported Gleaners and, you know, I want to support you in, in the good that you do in Warren. And, um, you know, some people, they think they're going to hold on to everything as if they're going to take it with them. You know, it was funny because I guess my mom <coughs> learned that lesson. Um, my mom has like 6,000 porcelain pigs that she saved over her whole lifetime and since my grandfather had a hog farm she didn't like the real pigs and the smell and <laughs> the things that come with those to, to clean up but you know she liked the expensive ones that cost more than real pigs but they were porcelain ones you couldn't eat them or do anything with them you just had them and you know she was wondering what she was going to do if something ever happened to her what she was going to do with her pig collection well you know, my mom came and went from this world this year, and she doesn't have to worry about her pig collection. And uh, the D Detroit Institute of Arts wanted to take her pig collection, but they said that she had to bubble wrap everyone individually and box it, and then send it to them, and they wanted them. But she had to do all the work, and at her age of 85, she wasn't thinking about bubble wrapping 6,000 pigs in bubble wrap and boxing them up and sending them any place. But, um, you know, she was so concerned about, you know, what's going to happen to my lifetime collection of pigs. 
then it doesn't matter. Once you're dead, you're dead. And all those pigs, someday they're going to have to find a home if something happens to my dad. Um, I'm not sure what he's doing with them. I hope he's feeding them still. And, um, Money. You know, uh, <laughs> and uh, whatever. But, you know, we hold on to things like as if we can keep it and, you know, take it with us. You know, and some people, they do that with their children or their house, you know, or their job or their future. You know, it's funny. You know, I mean, we should take care of our health, our bodies, a temple. But, you know, some people go overboard with that. And, um, you know, even your children belong to God. You know, that you, we call them our children or my children or whatever, but they're not your children. God's ultimately responsible for them. You're not. I mean, you should do the best you can um, while you're here, but ultimately they belong to God, and they belong to God way before they ever belong to you. <laughs> I mean, God knew about your children before you ever knew about them, and, um, you know, and the same goes... Um, for a husband or a wife, you know, they belong to God. Um, and, uh, you know, your husband, your wife, I mean, you might say, well, some days God could have them. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a whole other sermon. That's not what we're talking about today. But everything that you have belongs to God. Absolutely everything. And in the end, you have to give it all back to Him. Sometimes He'll take it back. Um, sometimes sooner than we wish he would, and sometimes, you know, we'd like to give it back because it's like, oh, I don't want that thing. But, um, you know, the absolute, uh, the absolute reality is everything you have belongs to God. And after you die, it'll belong to somebody else. And you'll, be, you'll no longer be the caretaker of it. You only have it on a temporary basis. Another point here is your personal trials actually relate to God's purpose for your life. Your personal trials can never be caused by blind fate or bad luck. You know, some of us say, you know, if I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. You know, we think, you know, the things that happen to us. <clears throat> I remember a couple months ago, I was on a, 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 a mission to help somebody. And on the way back, I was on I-75, and, you know, they're doing all kinds of work to I-75. I-75 is crazy. And um, I had Sue's car, and um, I didn't blow out one tire. I blew out two tires at the same time. And so, um, you know, both tires on the passenger side, completely blown out. So I called AAA. I have AAA. I call them and tell them what happened. They said, are you safe? And it's like... Well, there's no shoulder, and there's two lanes of traffic here. What do I do? <laughs> and she says, well, I want to know if you're safe or not. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't look like it. I said, everybody's going around me. Um, can't drive. Um, you know, and uh, you know, the tire, it almost, it was those holes in the road were almost big enough not only to swallow up and damage two tires, but, you know, could swallow up me as well. You know, and we could, we could say, well, it's just, bad luck or fate or something like that but you know God has a purpose in every single situation sometimes we don't see it sometimes we never will understand it but you know somehow all things relate to God's purpose in our lives and um, if that wasn't true then the Bible would not be true I mean think about this um, all the things that happen you know and if you don't come to believe this eventually You'll just give up your faith because then your faith has no validity in what the Bible actually teaches. See, when tragedy strikes, the tendency is we like to find a cause or a reason or an explanation or a chain of events or, you know, somebody to blame it on, you know. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, we like to stretch way back, you know. Well, you know, my, my first ex-wife, because all my exes live in Texas, right? It was her fault, but, you know, that was 40 years ago. I'm sure it was her fault. Um, but, um, you know, we try to explain everything from some other place. But, you know, as you search for causes, you go back and back and back and farther back until you come to the farthest place you can get, and that's God. Because um, un 
until at last you come to God, nothing makes sense. And as I say, if you don't eventually conclude that things happen to you somehow, everything flows from God, God has a loving purpose for your life and for the plans that he has for you, sooner or later, you know, you'll give up your faith if you don't think things come from God. And then the last and final point, the, the last takeaway is trials are designed to draw us nearer to God. See, when things happen, you have one of two choices. You can either run from God or run towards God. And one great biblical purpose for trials is, you know, to draw you in, not to push you away. But we often say, well, why did this happen to me? And why did this happen now? And, you know... But the deeper question is not, why did this happen, but will I remain loyal to God? And that's the biggest question. You know, will I continue to remain loyal to God in spite of the circumstance? And that brings us back to the sermon that I talked about, um, A.J. Gossip's sermon with the great question, you know, when life tumbles in, what then? You know, if we turn away from our faith in times of our troubles, you know, what are you going to turn to? Um, drugs, sex, um, television, video games. I mean, what are you going to turn to? Everybody turns to something. But, um, you know, all of us have to realize, you know, where do we go in times of trouble? Where do we go when life, the pain and pressure and problems of life seems like they crash in on us? And um, sometimes we think, well, you know, the most valuable thing that we ever possessed was taken from us. But if we give up our faith, that's really the most valuable thing that we do possess. And um, where do we go and what will we do? And, uh, you know, the pastor in his sermon put it this way. You know, um, he said, you people in the sunshine may believe you have faith, but in the shadow we must believe it um, because we have nothing else. So when life gets tough, when life gets impossible, um, if we don't believe it, you end up with nothing. And um, actually, um, I know a pastor who holds some seminars. And uh, during one of his sessions, the, the associate pastor of this particular church that I was attending the seminar said, you know, because God is love, no matter you know, how bad things get, you know, Christians should praise God. And uh, afterwards, one of the guys came up to him, and he was you could tell, greatly agitated, and he says, I don't buy it. You know, what do you mean God is love? I can't buy what you say about praising God in the midst of hurt. I can't believe what you say about praising God in the midst of evil. And uh, you know, then he went on to you know, say, you know, I don't believe that when you lose somebody that you love through death or when somebody's diagnosed with cancer, you lose your job, that you ought to praise God. And after a few moments of silence, the, the, the pastor said, well, what alternative do you propose? <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, are, are you going to, uh, you know, are you going to just whatever? But uh, there is really no other alternative. See, we do not gain if, if we turn away from God in the times of trouble. I mean, if we turn away from God when the pressure's on, when problems come at us, when pressures seem insurmountable, I mean, where else will we turn if we turn away from God? See, we only lose the ground of hope if we turn away from God. And if hope is the only thing we can stand on, why would anybody want to turn away from God? Um, but a lot of people do. And uh, as the Apostle Paul puts it at the end of Romans chapter 8, he said, what can separate us from the love of God? What? And uh, nothing at all can separate us from the love of God. Not life, nor death, no tragedy, nor heartbreak, nor suffering. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We're forever connected with God's love. And his love, you know, is a thousand times stronger than steel. I mean, no matter the toughest steel you could find, I'll have to ask my brother what kind of steel that is, maybe tungsten. Or some of those hybrid steels. My brother's in the tool and die business. He'd tell me what the strongest steel is. 
Um, just as a, a side note, um, in the tool and die business, they can do amazing things. He can cut steel blocks with water. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, EDM, electric discharge machining. It's pretty amazing what they do nowadays. But um, back to what I was trying to say is nothing can separate us from the love of God if we're in Christ Jesus, uh, um, our Lord. So the only question that remains is when life tumbles in, what then? You know, even though through tears we rest our confidence in the one great truth, um, he who brought us this far will take us safely home. And um, if we could only have that perspective, our lives would probably be a lot different. And in light of that, I was thinking about 1 Peter 1, um, it, it, it reads this way, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And here in this particular text, Peter begins a section with the words, In this you greatly rejoice. I mean, if we could only have that mindset, our, our pressures and pains and problems would probably be a lot different. In this phrase, in this, it refers to that, what we've learned, you know, repeatedly from the Gospels. You know, um, you know, here, I mean, they were scattered strangers, strategically positioned in a strange land to sow the seeds of the Gospel, and so are we. We're reminded that because God guards what he gives, we can praise him in the there's a number of truths here that um, we could glean from this because if you looked at this, this passage, you'd discover there's really a few truths about trials that we really should kind of get into our minds. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 12 that even when we're persecuted and reviled and hated, we can rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I mean, nobody likes to be persecuted. Nobody likes to be reviled. Nobody likes to be hated. Um, but um, Jesus himself said, even in those circumstances, we can rejoice and we can be exceedingly glad. But as I think about this passage from Peter that I, first Peter that I just um, told you, the interesting thing about trials is trials are just temporary. They don't last forever. You know, some of us think, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? Well, if you got God on your side, you will. And look at the next phrase from verse 6. Though now for a little while. You know, it's not forever, just for a little while. We can rejoice about what is ours in heaven, but we come to those words, though now. Right now, it's not going so well. Right now, it might not look so well. Right now, it seems like the high tides are going to sweep us over. And for some of us, you know, you're not sure. It doesn't feel like your struggles are just for a little while. Because when you're in the midst of struggles, they never feel like they're just for a little while. But the Bible tells us they're just for a little while. Even if they just last this whole lifetime, they're for a little while. Um, and the little words, the little while can mean for a season or a brief time. Um, the commentator Matthew Henry adds, these troubles that lie very heavy never come upon us, but when we have need and never stay longer than they must. The reason Peter can call trials temporary is because when compared to eternity, that's what our trials in this earth are. They're temporary. Thomas Watson, another commentator, said, afflictions may be lasting, but they're not everlasting. See, they won't last for eternity. And so Paul here, who was persecuted greatly, um, he went through all sorts of suffering. He wrote this in 2 Corinthians 4.17. He said, 
for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And Peter hits on the same point again in the last chapter of his letter. He said, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. See, that's what God's trying to do from the get-go. He wants to perfect you, establish you, strengthen you, and perfect you. That's 1 Peter 5.10. The second thing that trials do, um, they're, they're timely. This might be difficult for a lot of people to swallow, but suffering is something we have to go through. Not something that, um, you know, we may or may not go through. It's something we have to go through. And whether you're from this side of the tracks or that side of the tracks, um, like I said in Matthew, it says, you know, whether you're, you know, a dirty dog or the, a show dog or a pretty dog, you know, it's going to rain on everybody. It's just the way it is. But check out that next phrase, if need be. I mean, this could be translated as necessary or inevitable or a sense of duty. Actually, one Greek scholar renders it this way. He says, trials are continually necessary. In Matthew 16, 21, Jesus tells his followers that he must go to Jerusalem. It's not a suggestion. He says he must go. We all know what happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, you're going to go through challenges and difficulties. You're going to go through pain. You're going to go through pressures. You're going to go through problems. And we see this again in 2 Peter 3.12. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Maybe some of you don't have much persecution because you're not that seriously in Christ Jesus. But it says, to the, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, they will suffer persecution. See, trials also never take God by surprise. You know, sometimes we think, well, what was God thinking? You think he's surprised by what we go through? No, never. He knows in advance exactly what's going to happen to us. Tony Evans, the, the pastor from Texas, he nails it when he says, everything is either caused by God or allowed by God, and there is no third category. So either God allows it, or God causes it, and so it's one of those two. So when we say, well, what are you doing, God? I can't believe this happened to me. It's either he caused it, or he allowed it. There's no other option. Mm. And since God is good, he will bring good out of the bad which happens to us. Sometimes we think, oh man, this is so bad. You know, the classic example of this is when Joseph turned to his brothers who had wronged him so badly. I mean, his brothers left him for dead. They threw him down a cistern or a well. Bye, Joseph. Your dad's favorite, but we don't have to worry about you no more. You know, see ya. They threw him in a well to die. And then the caravan came by. The guy's going to Egypt. So they said, oh, we could get some money for Joseph. We'll sell him to this caravan of vagabonds. And uh, we'll get a couple bucks for Joseph. We'll put some goat, goat's blood on his multicolored coat. We'll bring the coat back to dad and say, Joseph's dead. And, uh. He was dragged as a slave back to uh, Egypt. But they didn't realize that God could work that out for good. And did it happen instantly? No. Joseph went to Egypt and found himself in jail. I mean, Potiphar, she said, well, Joseph was hitting on me. And really, Potiphar's wife, I mean, Potiphar's wife was hitting on him. So when Potiphar found out, throw Joseph in jail, you know. And, um, you know, it ended up that Joseph was second in command of all of Egypt under Potiphar, under the, the, the main guy. But after all his brothers did to him, you know, they tried to kill him. They left him for dead. They sold him off as a slave. In Genesis 50, verse 20, this is what Joseph says. But as far as for you, you meant evil against me, 
but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. See, his brothers, they had evil in their heart, evil intent. And basically what Joseph is saying is, what you meant for evil, God turned it into good. I'm the second most powerful guy in all of Egypt uh, under Potiphar. Not bad for, you know, for a little Jewish boy. I mean, think about this. I mean, he wasn't even Egyptian. And uh, he was put in charge. And uh, God chose favor. But I'm sure when he was being dragged to Egypt as a potential slave, he didn't think, oh, this is going to work out real well. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure when he was at the bottom of that cistern, left for dead, he's thinking, you know, my brothers put me here. This ain't going to work out well. But he could ultimately say, what you meant for evil against me, God meant for good. And that's how God works. It's a Romans 8.28. You know, all things work together for good. It doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work together for good. But then there's a caveat there for those who love the Lord. See, it's not for everybody. That's only a promise for God followers. So since trials don't take God by surprise, they might take us by surprise. You know, they really shouldn't take us by surprise. But oftentimes, you know, when things come and happen, you know, when I walked out a week ago Sunday and seen the disaster of this arson over here, it's like, Lord, how did this happen? You know, who the heck did this? I mean, and even the cops and the fire uh, investigators are like, who would be stupid enough to blow up food that you're trying to help people with? There's just some things that are inexplicable. I don't know why. I mean, you figure it out. And not just a little bit of food, but more than $20,000 worth of food. Mm. I mean, a huge amount of food. Way more than $20,000 now. Um, but, you know, I mean, oftentimes we're surprised about what happens. But what does Peter say in Peter? He reinforces this whole concept in uh, verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't think of it strange. See, when we see, when we see our, our trials that come at us, you know, and then we think, did God allow this? Did God send this? I mean, sometimes we just think, huh, sent by God for his glory? Sent by God for the ultimate good? I ain't seeing it. But we're able to say with the psalmist in Psalm Division 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. See, when we're afflicted, we, turn, we should turn to God, learn his word. Learn his ways. Learn to be closer to him. And that's the whole point of all of this. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes, learn your ways, learn what you want me to know about you, God. And by the way, I heard on the radio that the average American complains 70 times every single day. So a lot of people have advanced degrees in complainology. But if you have a great big God, why are you complaining at all? I mean, the average American complains. I mean, you know, moans and, you know, all those other words, but I can't use them in church. You know, um, yeah. Complains, you know, ba ha ha, 70 times a day. I mean, 70 times a day. If God sends suffering my way as something that is continually necessary for me to get on track with him, then why am I complaining continually? Because when we complain, we're really complaining against God. And that means we don't have the faith. I mean, if God allowed it or God sent it, who are we complaining about? Him. As if he doesn't know what he's doing. That might be your God. That's not my God. 
The third point that I want to make today is um, trials are terrible. I mean, trials are temporary and they're timely, but it doesn't mean that we have to like them. I mean, um, let's just think about this for a minute. I mean, trials are terrible. Can you say that? Trials are terrible. Well, you guys aren't convinced at all. You guys are sad. Not only do you complain 70 times a day, you do it under your breath. Okay. See, I love how honest the scriptures are. See, if we really understood what the scriptures were telling us, we don't have to act like we're not in pain when we're in pain. I mean, we see this in the last part of verse 6. You have been grieved by various trials. I mean, it says you've been grieved by various trials. This literally reads, you have been put to grief. I mean, the word grieved is translated as heaviness in the King James Version. And it means to be sad. It means to have sorrow. It means that there's weight and pressure on us. I sometimes surprise people when they tell me, you know, what they're going through. You know, maybe they expect a more spiritual answer from me. You know, but sometimes I say, man, that just stinks. You know, I feel sorry for you. I mean... You know, actually, that could probably be a pretty spiritual answer. See, when Jesus heard that Lazarus died in John eleven thirty five, the text tells us that Jesus wept. I mean, oftentimes, even as a minister, the only thing I can do is weep with people that are hurting and in lots of pain. And in Gethsemane, Jesus was deeply grieved. We read that in the text. He wasn't just grieved, he was deeply grieved. That means he was grieved all around. The pain and the pressure were just overwhelming. And I mean, not just grieved, but it says grieved to the point of death. I mean, that's real heavy grief. You'll find that in Matthew 26, verses 37 and 38, if you want a reference. But um, in Hebrews 12, 11, it describes God's Discipline, not as delightful, but as painful. See, you're going to experience repeated painful things, especially if you didn't learn the lesson the first thousand times God brought the lesson into your life. You know, we wonder, well, why are we still going around the same mountain? I mean, it's like the children of Israel. I mean, they were on a 12 to 14 day, 15 day journey. And they went around the same mountain for 40 years. I mean, you're going to repeat the same nonsense unless you learn and grow and move on. But, you know, you can keep going around the same mountain complaining 70 times a day. It's your choice. I mean, that's pretty much what the Bible tells us. But the word various can mean multicolored like Joseph's coat of many colors or it could mean manifold or, or, or something like that. The idea is that trials come in all shapes and sizes. They arrive over and over and over again. And they keep arriving, especially if we don't learn to walk and be more godly. You know, God's whole point in all of this is to make us children, to transform us into the men and women, the, 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 the children that he wants us to be. You know, it's funny, when I was a kid, my parents used to say, this is going to hurt me more than you. It's like, what the heck are you talking about? It hurt me a lot. And, um, you know, I used to think my parents were nuts. I mean, they're the ones swinging the bell. What do you mean it's going to hurt me more than you? And as, as a, a father of four biological children of my own, I kind of get that. Yeah. You know, when they swing the belt, it's the belt of discipline. But to hurt your child does hurt them more than you. And even though the welts are on your backside, <laughs> back when corporal punishment was acceptable. Yeah. It didn't kill me, though, so I mean, it must have did a little bit of good um, at some point. Um, but sometimes we see things coming, and other times, you know, we're ambushed by things that happen to us. But, um, you know, our problems range from, you know, problems that seem minute, that we make bigger. But, you know, maybe you have a runaway child. Maybe you have a broken heart. 
But James 1, 2 captures this whole idea that when you fall into various trials. See, James is the half-brother of Jesus, and he said, when, not if, but when you fall into various trials. All of us are going to fall into trial. after, As long as you've got breath in your lungs, you're going to be in various trials. And God's going to teach you something through those trials. And I know you don't want to hear that because it doesn't sound like one of those pick-me-up um, motivational messages that some other pastors might, might preach. But this is the Word of God. I just preach it as it is. But when you fall into various trials, and this passage from uh, Jesus' half-brother James, it's picked up in the book of Acts, in Acts 14.22. It says that, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So it's expected that we're going to go through many tribulations. And then in our relationship with Christ, we will attain the kingdom of God. And in Job uh, 5.19, since we've been talking about Job, um, um, Eliphaz, his, his friend, refers to six troubles of Job. Um, you know, Job lost his cattle and his sheep and his goats and his camels and his children. I mean, he probably had more than six troubles, one of the most righteous and wealthy men in the world. So, you know, my guess is that what we're going through now, right now, might be different than what other people are experiencing. But um, in all things that we go through, you know, all of us go through some kind of great difficulty and sometimes greater than at other times. But if you're hurting right now, just hold on, you know, um, and uh, God will deliver us. And if you're not in some great difficulty right now, hold on again because you shortly will have trouble. Um, it just happens to everybody. But the point that I'm trying to make is our trials are temporary, but they're also timely and they're also terrible. And then... There's one more thing I want to tell you is our trials are meant to be transforming. See, God really wants to use our trials to change us and to make us into the men and women that he wants us to be. And some of us, just like Job, we don't just face um, some trials. You know, it says that uh, Job's problems were six troubles. You know, I'm, I'm sure it's not a six-pack, but I mean... Um, you know, Job's problems were probably a lot more than that, but some of us face packs of problems. Like, you know, I got this problem, and I got that problem, and I got this other problem. Malcolm Mudridge once said, contrary to what you might be expected to think, I look back at experiences that at the time seemed specifically desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, everything I have learned and everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness. See, we don't learn much when everything's going well. You know, when everything's going well, we don't think about much. We just think about our own happiness. But it's in those times of great difficulty, and sometimes we only see it in hindsight. We look back and think, thank God that happened, because if that hadn't happened, then these other things would have, wouldn't have happened, and it would life wouldn't be, you know, um, you know, uh, where we are right now. But um, it's just kind of interesting because, you know, we could underline that word that. You know, other, other translations capture it so that. And this means that there's a, pur there's a purpose behind the problems that we experience because trials are meant to fortify our faith. They're not meant to destroy our faith. See, when problems come our way and pain, pressure, and and circumstances hit us um, sideways. I mean, it's all meant to fortify our faith. And God has a plan to use your pain for his purposes. And specifically, when responded to correctly, our trials become transforming. That's what God wants us to do, transform our lives so that we can be little Jesuses, just like him. And I see, I see a, about four ways that we can grow up when we're being torn down. See, oftentimes the things of the kingdom are reversed to the things of the world. You know, the world says, you know, up is up, and God says to go up, you have to go down. But, you know, 
Um, first of all, trials strengthen our faith in the Lord, or they should. You know, we see this in verse 7, like I said, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glorify at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's the point. That word genuine, the genuineness of your faith, it refers to something that is proven, something that's approved. So your faith needs to be absolutely genuine, something that's, you know, absolute. And just as gold is purified through fire, and our faith is often proven through our pain. You know, we learn more through our pain than we do when things are going well. And God said this again in Isaiah 48.10. It says, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. You know, if I passed around a, a, a clipboard today, nobody would say, I want to sign up for more of that, that furnace of affliction. Nobody would sign up for that. But Isaiah knew it. Job knew it. Job knew that his suffering would serve to strengthen him when he cried out in Job 23.10, he said, But he, God, knows the way that I take. And when he, God, has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. See, God wants to purify you. He wants to put you in that fiery furnace. It says, tested by fire. He wants to take you and, and throw you into the furnace of affliction and, and, and get rid of those things that he knows aren't good for you. And then you're going to come forth as gold. And Job was already the most righteous man around, the most righteous man in town. And if Job could say, you know, I know the way that I take. And when God has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So he even recognized, even though he was the most righteous, that there was more testing needed to make him more pure gold. See, the way it works is a faith that's not tested can't be trusted. See, if, if, you're, if you've just been living on Easy Street or, well, you know, we've talked about that before. It's over here in Warren off a of 10 mile, Easy Street. Yeah. You know, um, but, you know, if, you, if you've been on Easy Street or if you just, if your life is easy breezy and everything's all peaches and cream, well, wonderful. But, you know, that's not real because real faith has to be tested before it can be trusted. You know, in the Bible, in, in biblical times, when a craftsman would make something of fine gold, he would put it in intense heat so that all the impurities would be burned off and, and burned out. The goldsmith would know the work was done when he could see the reflection of his own face in that liquefied gold. And sometimes God turns up the heat in our own lives in order to work out the impurities that he wants to eliminate from our lives. Um, one of my favorite ministers that's living today Dr. Erwin Lutzer from Moody, he said this, God often puts us in situations that are too much for us so that we will learn that no situation is too much for him. If everything went well for you, how would you know that you really had real faith? See, we're tested and we're tried because God wants us to know that our relationship with him is real and that we can have real faith in him. So you know your faith is real, you know, when you're able to give praise and honor and glory at the, at the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. So if you're in that furnace right now and it feels hotter than ever, I mean, there's a psalm, Psalm Division 66, uh, verses 10 through 12, that says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you have brought us out to rich fulfillment. See, that's what God wants to do. He'll bring us out through rich fulfillment. And you know, God's grace is, is always enough. You know, trials deepen our love for the Lord too. That's another thing that we should learn it says, whom having not seen you love, though now 
Do you see him yet believing? See, Peter had this pleasure of actually seeing Jesus face to face, but we don't have that option right now. But we can love him even without seeing him. In fact, Jesus pronounces a blessing upon those who choose to believe in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 29. It says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, the apostles who have written a lot of these verses, they walked with Jesus, they talked with Jesus, they were intimate with Jesus. He was physically in their presence. But Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. The word for love is agape, which refers to unconditional, not emotional love. But the trials have a way of getting us to believe what really matters. We might skate along on superficial things. We might skate along on emotional levels for a while. But, you know, when big things come, sooner or later, you know, we have to learn to love the Lord on a much deeper level. It's funny. Um, sometimes I think our, our faith is, you know, just acres of, of grass and it's, you know, just one or two inches deep, you know, instead of like a big oak tree, you know, just one big tree, but way down deep, you know, that oak can withstand anything because it's deep, not just like grass that it has superficial roots. But... When we, when we think about this text, there's one little word that says yet in this passage. Job declared in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That little three-letter word, yet, means all the difference. See, Job realized what was going on. He realized that God had a part. Like I said, God either allows it or God causes it. But God had a part. And Job, his faith was so great, though he, God, slay me, yet I will trust him. I mean, when your faith is that deep, you got real faith. And the psalmist in Psalm 119, 141 says, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. See, I mean, you might say, Lord, I'm getting bounced around here pretty hard. But yet... I will still believe in you. What's your yet? You know, we all have a yet. You know, Lord, though I've experienced such great loss, yet, Lord, I still love you. Lord, I'm despised, yet I'm going to stay in your word. I'm going to stay faithful. You know, Lord, they say nasty things about me, yet I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to believe. I'm going to continue to walk. I mean, we all have a yet. Though you slay me, yet I will remain surrendered to your plans. I will remain surrendered to your purposes. I mean, that's where we really should be as Christians. What's your yet? See, trials grow our joy in the Lord too. I mean, think about this for just a second. It seems counterintuitive to have joy when we're going through so much pain, pressure, and problems, so much crap in our lives, you know? And, and how can we have joy when we have trials and troubles? And how can we rejoice? I mean, how can you say trials and rejoicing are linked together? I mean, it doesn't even make sense, you know, but that's what the Bible says. But look at the last part of verse eight. You rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. And this brings us back to verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. You see, sadness and gladness often exist side by side. It's one of the greatest paradoxes of Christianity. Sadness and gladness, they're often side by side. We see this in Acts 5, 41, when Peter and John left the council. It says, Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. I mean, how could you feel that way? I mean, to suffer. I mean, these are guys, I mean, um, well, one killed himself, but the other ten were murdered for the sake of Christ. John's the only one 
I mean, they boiled him in oil, didn't kill him. And so he was exiled to the island of Patmos and died of an old age there after he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But every one of the disciples, do you think they would have died for the sake of Christ if they didn't fully believe? Nobody would give their life for nothing. I mean, some were cut in half, some were, well, they, were, they, were, they all were killed. And it was brutal. But, um, you know, it's kind of interesting how Peter and John, how they could say we're rejoicing that we would be considered to suffer worthy, the shame for his name. And trials help us in our hope of the Lord. When we're going through a bunch of life's garbage, it's, it helps us to focus not on the present life, but the life to come. See, if you're actually born again and you're a believer, you know, you'll receive the salvation of your soul. And we see this at, in verse 9. It says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. And so there's an end game here. See, trials, you know, they might not ultimately even be understood until the end. You know, but we're, we're going to receive salvation now if we're saved. But, you know, we won't receive everything until we meet the Lord face to face. And that's our living hope. Let me try to put this in a little bit of, of, of a perspective. Just give me another hour, please. <laughs> Too many meatballs. Oh, my goodness. I didn't get my meatballs yet. Oh, <laughs> where, do, where do we sign up for those? I heard there's a good dinner here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know trials are meant to fortify our faith trials are temporary they're timely they're terrible and they're transforming those are the three T's that I tried to tell you but only if we respond correctly see otherwise you have to repeat you know you're just going to go around um, that mountain over and over and over again but um, you know I mean if you have bitterness confess your bitterness to God you know, bitterness will actually short-circuit God's plan to use your problems for his purpose. Ouch. See, a lot of us, when things go bad that we're not happy with, we turn bitter. It's easy to turn bitter. That's why the Bible says don't let a bitter root, uh, you know, grow up. And it says that, look what it says in Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, when you have bitterness that grows in you, it doesn't just defile you, it defiles many. So when we have bitterness that grows in our hearts, it grows deep and causes trouble for us, and then it defiles, it ripples out and defiles all those people around us. You know, so, I mean, be careful. I mean, you know, some people talk about problems that happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. You know, take that garbage out to the curb and let the garbage man take it away. I mean, why are you still carrying garbage? From, I mean, let it go. I mean, is it unforgiveness? Is it bitterness? Is it hostility, anger? I mean, let it go. You know, but, um, you know, bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> you know, I mean, so let it go. And I, I've said this a hundred times from this pulpit. You know, when we have unforgiveness anger, bitterness, it always destroys the container that holds it. And we think it's, it's for, for somebody else. The, the second point that I want to make um, as just a takeaway is give up your demand to know why you're going through pain. No matter how hard it is, that, you know, some of us, we stay up at night trying to figure everything out. You're not going to figure everything out. And um, there's always going to be some mystery to your misery. And God doesn't have to explain himself um, to us, um, nor does he have to explain himself. So, um, And the third point is, um, give God the right to say no to you. You know, God already has the right to say no, but it's important for us to admit this. You know, I love the model of Jesus who Paul followed when he prayed three times for the suffering to be taken away in, in the Gospel of Mark. Um, and uh, in Mark 14, 36, Abba Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. 
Um, you know, sometimes we have to realize, you know, that uh, our suffering is part of God's plan. Suffering came to Paul and to Jesus, not because they were out of the Father's will, but they because they were in the Father's will. And so um, an, another point that I just want to leave you with is, you know, treat your trials as a gift from God. Think about your biggest trial and then say, thank you, God. Thank God for it. I mean, thank him and thank him. See, because trials and troubles are a sign of God's love. If he didn't love us, he would not discipline us. See, a good father always disciplines his children. Just like I said, I never understood when my parents said, this is going to hurt you more than me. But, um, you know, a good father disciplines us. It's Hebrews 12, 4 through 11, if you want a, a biblical reference to it. But some of you might say, well, then, you know, God must love me a lot because I get a lot of discipline. <laughs> yeah, I'm not about myself. Okay, don't look at me like that. Um, and another point is, you know, you use suffering as a means to minister to other people. You know, Paul wanted that thorn in his flesh to be removed so that he could get on with his ministry and get on with his life. But he learned that this malady multiplied his ministry. You know, and um, have you ever thought about how God can use something that you go through that you think is horrible, you know, to help it, to help somebody else? I mean, look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us, in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So sometimes what we go through, God sends us through that so that we can extend comfort to somebody else who's going through a similar thing. A reporter once asked Mother Teresa, when a baby dies alone in a Calcutta alley, where is God? And I love her response. She says, God is there suffering with that baby the real question is where were you uh. and we're supposed to go with the gospel and expect persecution i covered that point um, pretty carefully but um, um i'm not going to belabor that one but the, the the next point that i want to make is we have to put our trust in jesus who suffered in our place in order to solve the sin problem not any sin problem, your sin problem. So while we won't be delivered from all evil and all suffering right now, you know, if you're saved, when you leave this world, if you don't receive Christ into your life, you know, the pain and suffering you experience now will be nothing like the eternal torment and the unending agony that awaits you when you die if you're not in Christ Jesus. But if you're a Christian... The good news is, this is as bad as it gets. And if you're not a Christian, this is as good as it gets. So, now you know I told you. So don't complain, and don't call me from wherever you end up at, because I'm not sure if they're going to let you have that last phone call anyways. No service. Yeah, no service. Your phone will overheat, and they'll tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> But I came across this poem. I used this poem once before, but this poem was on the body of a Confederate soldier, and I'll end with this, during the Civil War. And this soldier said, I asked for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I might do better things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked God for power that I might have power to pray in the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy my life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am amongst men most richly blessed. And that's how it is for most of us. I mean, we will, we will all experience various multifaceted trials in life, but we could picture it this way. 
hold up your left hand and see each of the five fingers as representing the specific struggles that you're going through. Five. Some of you may have less than five. Some of you may have more than five. Now hold up your right hand as well. In 1 Peter 4.10, God refers to grace as the manifold, multicolored grace of God. Imagine that your multifaceted trials are covered by God's multifaceted grace. That as you take your hands and you put them together, God's grace corresponds exactly to whatever you're going through today. And when our problems and God's promises are put together, it's a perfect picture of prayer. With that, let us pray together. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that our problems, Lord, are, are not that significant and not that serious in light of you. Father, I pray that we would adopt this text and understand what Job went through and understand what we go through are all just lessons from you. You allow things and you cause things. But Lord, it's all to train us and teach us and transform us into the children that you want us to be. A good father disciplines his children. And Lord, we know discipline is so lacking in our world today. Help us understand that discipline is part of life, especially if we choose to live godly lives. And especially if we want to be little junior Jesuses that look more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray this night that as we lift our hands and join them together in prayer, that we see the awesomeness of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, show us, Lord, in spite of how many problems we might have, you're in the midst of it, Lord, and by faith we can stand no matter what comes our way. There's no pain, there's no pressure, there's no problems that are bigger than you. And there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. And God bless all of you.